Wow. Oh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Foreman. I'm going to be moderating the panel. We have a wonderful panel of content experts. Let me first start by congratulating the student committee for their choice of the movie today. I hear, I hear there were a range of options, and they, they did extremely well with this very, very powerful meditation on migration more generally. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce our, our panel, uh, give some sh brief bios. I'll hand over to the panel to each give uh, reflections on, on the film. We'll then have a, a, a moderated discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll open up to uh, the audience for discussion and questions. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Alison Mounts, who's a Canada Research Chair in Global Migration and a Professor of Geography at Wilfrid Laurier University. She was the 2015-16 Mackenzie King Visiting Professor of Canadian Studies at Harvard University, and her scholarship explores migration and detention on islands in U.S. war resistor histories in, Canada's, in Canada. She has a, a range of books that I encourage you to uh, look up yeah, on, on various topics related to this. Dr. Meb Rashid has uh, spent the last 15 years of his career working with newly arrived refugees in Canada. He's the medical director of the Crossroads Clinic, a medical clinic that serves refugees arriving in Toronto. He is co-founder of Canadian Doctors for Refugee Care, an organization founded to advocate for refugees to access health insurance. He's also the co-founder of the Christie Refugee Health Clinic, which is uh, located in a refugee shelter. He was on the steering committee of the Canadian Collaboration for Immigrant and Refugee Health, a group that provides, uh, that develops evidence-based guidelines for the assessment of newly arrived immigrants and refugees. And he's brought clinicians together through Canada with an interest in refugee health through a web-based project called Canadian Health Network and through a group called the Refugee Health Network of Southern Ontario. Appropriately so, he has received uh, the OMA Presidential Award and an Award of Excellence from the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Rashid is on staff at the Women's College Hospital in Toronto and is an assistant professor with the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Last, uh, Professor Jennifer Heinemann, uh, who's director of the Centre for Refugee Studies and a professor in the Department of Social Science at York University. Professor Heinemann's work as a geographer focuses on the geopolitics of forced migration, the biopolitics of refugee camps, humanitarian responses to war and displacement, and refugee settlement in North America. Uh, Professor Heinemann is the author of um, uh, a number of books on related topics uh, and has uh, conducted a range of research. With that, I'll hand over to the panel for reactions. this on? Yes. Uh, well, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers who put together the event. Um, I agree, you, you chose an important film and it's a, a good launching point for us to talk about issues that are, are so timely um, and that are uh, what we call relational, relational geographies, that migration um, everywhere is impacting people everywhere. And so I want us to think a little bit about that. This film does a really nice job, I think, of showing the, the local context in, in Lampedusa. Often we hear about migration at sea, we hear a lot about deaths at sea and the statistics that were mentioned earlier, but sometimes overlooked are the local communities and the context in which people arrive are really embodied in this film, particularly by Samuele and um, the doctor as well. Uh, we see that both groups, the islanders and migrants who are coming to the island, are connected to the sea, albeit in very different ways, but both for livelihood and for survival. Um, and we see that migration is uh, at once, uh, uh, mass migrations are events, they're often crises, humanitarian crises, uh, but they're also part of the fabric of everyday life. And we see the film trying to show that for, for Lampedusans, that everyday life un unfolds sometimes very quietly um, while these humanitarian crises uh, unfold simultaneously on this very small island in separate spaces. Uh, there's a kind of quiet calm to the film, which is really a juxtaposition to what's a very disorderly and sometimes chaotic um, series of events related to people's prolonged displacements and movements across the sea. Uh, 
Lampedusa, as was mentioned, is a, it's a small island with about five or 6,000 residents who are primarily a fishing community. So the two um, biggest uh, industries on the island are fishing and also tourism. So tourists come from Italy and also from the rest of the EU. And I should mention that I've been working on uh, research over the last several years about political asylum and migration on islands. And Lampedusa is actually one of the field sites where, where I've worked. And um, one of the reasons why islands have come to the fore as a global phenomenon in relation to the high rates of migration and displacement that you hear about is that they're often the closest bits of sovereign territory that people can get to when they take to the sea. So they're places where they can reach to, make, uh, to land and make a claim for asylum. And what happens is that as migration increases in those um, marginal, geographically marginal or borderland areas, um, authorities begin to put more and more resources there into enforcement, border enforcement and also interception at sea. And so Lampedusa's history has gone through a very similar trajectory to other islands um, that have this phenomenon, such as Australia's Christmas Island, for example, where um, uh, for a long time, Lampedusa functioned as a space of transit or passage. So people would land there and they would be taken to Sicily and eventually enter Italy, either making asylum claims or entering the labor force. Um, policymakers often refer to these uh, groups as mixed flows. So some of them will fit into the convention definition of a refugee and others will be considered economic migrants or those who are traveling for, for work or for survival. Um, but over time, Lampedusa has become more of what geographers might call a carceral space or a space of expulsion as detention has been built up, as interceptions have been built up, and as Italy and the European Union has moved its borders through externalization farther and farther out to sea, collaborating, for example, with other authorities um, to police people closer and closer to the coast of North Africa. So in this um, film, we see what some have called the humanitarian enforcement nexus. We see rescues at sea, we see interceptions. And I'd say, if anything, um, we see a little bit more of the humanitarian side of that and a little bit less of the enforcement side. We're on the edges of detention spaces, but there's not a lot of talk about what happens to the migrants once they've arrived, once they've been taken off the ships. Um, and, and something that's been happening all across uh, this area, including on Lampedusa, but also on Sicily um, and in North Africa, is a proliferation of detention facilities and spaces of confinement. So for example, on Sicily, there are now about eight detention facilities and many people will be transferred from Lampedusa to those uh, facilities while they have their asylum claims adjudicated. Others will be intercepted at sea and brought back to North Africa. And so many who are studying this call it a revolving door where, peop where people spend years uh, trying to get in and being sent back, years in limbo waiting um, in different spaces along the way. And I think that was beautifully represented by that group performance um, in song, almost a spoken word performance of the journey that was very reflective of, of how the journey unfolds for many people um, who spend time you know, crossing several international borders, crossing the Sahara, experiencing many different kinds of death along the way, um, and then, uh, of course, undertake the precarious journey at sea. Uh, a lot of research about border enforcement at sea looks at uh, the investment, the tremendous investment of resources by authorities. So to give you one statistic, um, between 2006 and 2015, the European Union through Frontex, which is the coordinating agency of the policing of the external border, spent about 300 million uh, euros on just marine operations at sea. And that is now um, dwarfed by the, what keeps um, intensifying in terms of the investments. The main rationale behind these investments in enforcement, whether it's in interception or, or detention, is the idea of deterrence, trying to deter people from coming. Um, but most research over the years shows that deterrence doesn't actually work as a, as a policy, and so people continue to come. So what happens is that as enforcement intensifies, the journey becomes more precarious. People continue to leave, um, but, they, but they undertake riskier journeys. Uh, and they become uh, more difficult.
So uh, the images that you, you saw in the film are very common ones uh, in terms of interceptions of boats. Um, people wearing the suits and masks and um, counting, checking for disease, this kind of very medicalized um, moment when people are entering. And we've seen these images here in Canada too um, when there have been boat arrivals, albeit in much uh, smaller numbers. And then the island itself becomes uh, a space, uh, almost a, um, what uh, Italian scholar Paolo Cutita argues is an observatory where we can glimpse, we have a snapshot of what, what, what some call the global governance of migration, how the international community and also the local community of Lampedusa is responding to migration. And what Lampedusans live out is this rhythm whereby um, the migrations fluctuate. So there might be quiet years and then intense years that really reflect conflicts around the world uh, when people, more people come. So for example, in 2011, during political uprisings, um, there were close to 60,000 people who landed on the island, um, not at one given time, but the island was inundated with people and pe locals were overwhelmed and the facilities were overflowing and there were people sleeping really in many parts of the island. And so you can imagine moments when the international community um, and humanitarian agencies kind of descend on the island, these very um, spectacular moments where the, there's global attention paid and then other kind of quieter moments where life goes back to the, the kinds of rhythms that we saw um, people living in, in the film. Uh, just to close, I wanted to mention just a, a direct connection between what, what's happening today in Canada and what we saw happening uh, in the film. Um, because there are, uh, because there's more and more enforcement at sea taken on on the Mediterranean by the EU or carried out by the EU, people are looking for other places to migrate. So I mentioned that idea of relational geographies, that, that displacement continues and migration will always continue uh, where people need to find either livelihood or protection. And so um, what we see are these legal geographies where people are looking for a place where they can um, make a claim for asylum. So if they can't get into the EU, they'll go other places. And one of the routes that has increased as a result of the EU externalization is routes through Central America and Mexico and then up into North America. And so right now we see an increase, for example, in people from Africa crossing uh, the US-Canada border. So there's a very direct and relational um, geography always between life here and life and life there. And the last thing I'll just mention since we're uh, here to talk about global health is that you can see in this film um, physical but also issues around mental health, uh, particularly related to trauma and the precarity of the journey that people travel. And one of the things I quite like about the film is that it also shows the secondary trauma or hints at the secondary trauma of those who are also working with migrants um, and responding to the arrivals embodied really, especially in the, in the doctor in the film. Thanks so much. I too would like to um, just uh, make a vote of thanks to the organizers, to TIFF uh, for having us here today and to everyone in the audience. Uh, speaking about the film and about migration and health is a tall order uh, for someone who has not done research in Lampedusa on these issues. So I'll keep it brief, but I wanted to use um, my background in humanitarian response as a way to sort of cut through some of these issues and think about the film uh, and the doctor, as it were. Uh, there are, I can see in the audience, other people who could speak uh, to, to some of these issues much better than I, but let's, I'll be brief and, and hopefully we can get to the discussion, which, is, uh, which will be fun. So uh, in terms of humanitarianism, humanitarianism, what I'm speaking of then is a, is a, a right to life uh, kind of the core principle of, of response is it doesn't matter whether you're fighting for ISIS, feeding the ISIS fighter, or whether you're on the other side in the Russian jet or whatever. If you're, if you're, if you're dying, you have a, there's a right to life. And, and for civilians and for migrants in this case, um, saving them is, is the first order of, um, of the day. Uh, the principles of humanitarianism are of course derived from international humanitarian law. But here we're really looking at practice, um, impartiality, neutrality, uh, independence in terms of the action that you take 
and humanity, which is always the one I, I can never quite uh, grasp, but I think humanity is, is one in this film that we see, and I, I do think we see it embodied in the doctor, his encounters with both people from Lampedusa, but, but mostly, mostly the migrants. Um, the first scene we, we see him in is the one with the, the pregnant woman who has been rescued from the boat. Uh, we see him uh, actually scanning people's, thing, obviously kind of public health scan, getting off the boat. We see him discussing the cadavers uh, and the, the very dark side of, of this kind of work. We also see him uh, uh, examining Samuele's uh, rather well-fed little chest and talking to him about his anxiety and, and, and just the care with which he does this. And I think, I think these scenes maybe capture that humanity in the sense that there's an equivalence of, of subjectivity. All our souls, our humans are, are treated with a care. Um, maybe uh, equity is not the right word, but, uh, but there is a, a, an equivalence of, of subjectivity in that, in that respect, uh, in the way the doctor approaches his work. And I can't remember his exact words, but he says something along the lines of, it is our duty to help these people. Um, and, and I think that too gets at some of these things. I, um, I don't know that the humanitarian principle is fully achieved in the film, however, in terms of character development. So I wanted to, to challenge or challenge people to think with me about this. Um, of course, Samuele, the young boy, appears to be the protagonist. Much of the film centers on him, and you know we get to know him and his home and his family and so on. The the migrants, on the other hand, are much are much more two dimensional. They're they're always in a group. Um, they we don't actually know the name of any one of them. Um, we we witness their agony, uh, and yet it is it is hard for us to identify with those characters in the same way. So while there might be some equivalence of subjectivity, there isn't the same for me anyway, connection with those characters. And I think with migrants, especially with boat arrivals, we have to really be careful um, not, to, not to always portray them in groups, uh, people that come on a boat. Uh, and of course, as Alison mentioned, many people have come to Canada, not many actually, very few if you, if you count the actual numbers of people, but the individ individuality, the histories, um, we don't want these to be obscured by the framing of them as boat arrivals and always in groups. And I think even the juxtaposition of, of the boys' bodies, two of the boys anyway in the film, Samuele, um, the live boy, but the very um, uh, unfortunate and sad picture of the, of the, of the cadaver boy that the doctor is speaking of, who's who's got chemical burns, who's who's pat, who's who's dead in the in, and in a photo, um, just the life chances of these these different uh, characters is quite clear. Uh, so I'm not like I said I'm not sure uh, that the film works on that level, but that was that's uh, my take on it, not necessarily uh, the director's or the writer's uh, purpose. I do think that uh, what's clear in the film is that. In the Mediterranean, the humanitarian right to life brushes up against uh, against enforcement, as Alison put it, but or what might be called the state, you know, right to sovereignty and and national security, which we hear a lot about. And I want I think one thing that the film does extremely effectively is it counters this notion of migrants as just threats, as just looking for a free ride or a better life. Um, although, there, you know, no doubt some people are survive, <laughs> trying to survive and and. Uh, and get out for reasons other than political persecution. So on that note, um, I think uh, I'll stop there and uh, and pass it on to Dr. Rashid. Great, um, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you to the organizers. It's uh, it's truly a, a very riveting film. Um, sort of approach my comments from a bit of a different perspective. Uh, my experience has really been in dealing with refugees and refugee claimants uh, here in Canada. And I've spent uh, um, quite a bit of my career working with uh, newly arrived people here in Toronto. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing I, I would suggest is certainly what we're seeing here in Canada is nowhere near uh, what, uh, what the film portrayed. Um, you know, in Canada, I, I think we're shielded by geography, right? We're, we've got oceans uh, on three sides and the United States on the other side. And to get here, uh, as we see in the film, is, a, is often a, a very torturous journey. So many of the, the people we see in our clinic, although they might have survived the Mediterranean or traversed the borders of North Korea or the, the, the deserts of Sudan, 
by the time they get here, they've, they've sort of shaken off the dust and uh, a lot of their physical injuries, at least, um, would have healed. Um, and what we can see in the film is that, uh, you know, it's often a very traumatic and dangerous journey. And uh, a colleague of mine once uh, referred to it as a, a grotesque survival test. You know, if you're ill, if you're elderly, uh, you're not going to survive the journey. And as a result, um, you know, most of the people we end up seeing here in Canada as refugees and refugee claimants are, are actually quite healthy. Uh, I mean, the, the people that we uh, see every once in a while arriving on boats or crossing the border um, uh, through the height of winter. I mean, we've seen the exceptions. But generally, most people are quite healthy. From a, a health point of view, and I was asked really to comment on what we're seeing in newly arrived refugees here. Um, as most of you know, we'll often see people who come from countries where there's a higher prevalence of infectious diseases. But I would argue that most of those are, are easily treatable when diagnosed early. So you know, we see scabies, and you saw the doctor looking for scabies as people left the boat. Um, you know, you'll see things like uh, like parasites, and we actually even had a case of malaria this week in our clinic. But those are all easily treatable. And even things like tuberculosis, which is obviously a huge public health concern, um, I mean, it's quite rare. Uh, there's about 350 cases in Toronto every year. Not all are in refugees. Certainly a very small number would be in refugees. And we always at our clinic see one a year. And if, for some reason, never two, never zero. And we like to get it out of the way early in the year so we can relax. Uh, um, it's it's not, not the huge issue that we hear about. Uh, hepatitis B is a big player. Uh, about 5% of the people we see in our clinic will have that virus that causes chronic liver disease and certainly can cause liver failure and uh, liver cancer uh, in people. And that rate is much higher in some of the populations we see. Um, the other thing that we've been seeing is a lot of people who obviously have not had access to primary care. Sometimes we see the sequelae of war, people with broken bones, um, sexually transmitted infections, which uh, may or may not be the result of sexual violence. And of course, mental health. And after seeing these pictures, um, it's easy to understand that we spend most of our, or significant part of our days dealing with things like post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. But saying that, I think one of the really important things to recognize is that, um, you know, although people have endured horrific things, the vast majority of people that we see that, that arrive here um, actually don't suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder or, or depression. Most people, it's not to say they, they haven't been affected or it doesn't change the way they view the world or relationships or a sense of the future, um, but most people put their lives back together again. And it's really a very small minority uh, that are truly impaired from mental health issues. And I think that's sometimes not intuitive for us. I remember seeing a study uh, that came out of Rwanda soon after the genocide. And although there might have been methodological issues, as there always are in studies around mental health, uh, it showed 25% of the population had post-traumatic stress disorder. And not to diminish that, I mean, that's a tremendous number, uh, especially on the population level. But what was interesting for me is that despite seeing perhaps some of the worst things that human beings can do to other human beings, 75% of people didn't have PTSD. And I think that's, that's a really important thing to remember for us, that most of the people we see that uh, they arrive in Canada, you know, they want to learn English, they want to get employment, they want to put their lives back together again, they want to contribute. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the best research we have probably comes out of the migration of... Uh, of the Southeast Asian refugees that came in the, the early 1980s and through the work of Dr. Morley Beiser, who's here in Toronto right now, but was in British Columbia at that time. He was able to follow um, over 1,000 people for 10 years. And what did he find? Well, he found that uh, actually rates uh, of mental health were lower in refugee populations than people who are Canadian-born. And interestingly, rates of employment were, were higher than people who are Canadian-born. So I think the issue for us is really, you know, how do we take that tremendous human capital, those people with such tremendous resiliency and make sure they, they do flourish here and uh, ensure that they uh, become productive members of Canadian society. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, before I hand over to the audience for some questions, I have a, a, a couple of questions for the panel. I'll, I'll actually ask the panel before I pose those questions if any of you have responses to each other to uh, the reactions that you just put forward. You okay? Uh, Alison, I, I wanted to uh, ask you to expand on the humanitarian enforcement nexus that you spoke about and the way that landing sites are becoming carceral spaces. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what that nexus looks like in Canada. How is Canada doing in terms of the balance between humanitarian response and enforcement? And I'm thinking specifically here of the extent of detention of uh, immigrants and refugees that we have nationally. 
I think it's important to note that we're um, uh, we're eliding a lot of different groups of people who are on the move um, between the film and then those spaces of passage that I mentioned and that we saw pictured there, the borderlands where people are crossing in between states, and then what happens once they're inside of sovereign territory. So within Canada, we could talk about also two groups, um, those who are seeking asylum or making refugee claims, uh, and those who uh, have been brought as resettled refugees. So we're talking about such different groups of people coming from all over the world in very different circumstances and then having really different experiences uh, once they arrive here. But to your question, um, I think uh, Canada has certainly in recent years um, increased its capacity uh, and some of its practices around enforcement and detention both in terms of the material potential and spaces uh, of enforcement, border enforcement and detention, and also capacity. Um, and so we've seen a, a lot of, for example, front end security, a lot of offshore enforcement, a lot of things written into law and policy that make it more difficult actually to seek asylum um, or refugee status in Canada. So I would say, um, and, I, and I bring that up first because we hear so much about uh, resettled uh, refugees these days, particularly Syrians, which has been a re remarkable you know, movement in, in this country. Um, but we hear less in, in daily news about those who, um, who are often called by policymakers spontaneous arrivals, so people who, who might um, use various resources to make an unauthorized entry because, or, or maybe enter on one visa and then make an asylum claim because you can't you can't apply for, uh, uh, there's no visa for asylum. <laughs> um, and so uh, once they, many, many can't get here. Um, so this is the way in which I was, again, thinking about relational geographies. Um, people are, are in search of asylum around the globe um, and they'll go where they're able to. And, and not a lot uh, are making it um, to Canada these days in spite of the recent spike that we've seen from, um, from the US into Canada. But others might want to add to that. I mean, the only thing I would suggest is, um, you know, detention breaks people. I mean, it's astonishing. And, and someone who's worked with refugees for quite a while, it still surprises me. And I, I'll meet people who have arrived and fled you know, horrendous things. And But really, when I speak to them, they'll speak about their, their time in detention. If they've been there for three or four months, um, it, it breaks people. I can think of a gentleman who was fleeing um, horrible persecution because of his sexual orientation and, uh, you know, had... had bones broken from, from uh, trauma that he'd had uh, in his country of origin. Um, but he would weep when he would talk about his time being put in detention when he arrived here. And he would say he wasn't treated poorly, the facilities weren't atrocious, but I think there's this um, sense that when, you'd, when he'd arrived that things would be better. And then to be incarcerated like that, I think broke him. And I can think of a number of people like that. So um, certainly in terms of consequences, uh, uh, mental health consequences, that seems to really push a lot of people over the precipice. Yeah. Can I just add one thing as well? Um, because I've been doing this research in remote places. And there's a lot of scholarship coming out of Australia, which is pretty masterful when it comes to offshore detention on islands. So a lot of the research as a result has come out of public health and psychology there. And um, some of that work looks at the effects of the length of detention and the remoteness of detention. And I think this builds on what you were saying. It's the, it's the, it's the limbo that people experience that is, is so difficult and so damaging. Um, living that stress of uncertainty for a prolonged period of time. And so what the research shows is that the longer that people are in detention and the more remote the detention, um, the more acutely we see the effects on their physical health and mental well-being. Um, and so you see, for example, greater instances of self-harm or suicide attempts in very remote sites of detention. Uh, in the Australian context, this would be Christmas Island and Nauru and um, Manus Island. Uh, Meba, I'm wondering, you, you speak uh, very uh, uh, eloquently about the winnowing effect that the, 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 the distance of Canada has on who gets here and who doesn't, um, and to some extent that we're shielded by geography. But I wonder the extent to which somebody who's extremely ill would have a chance of being selected 
to as a refugee to come to Canada. So I wonder the extent to which our the 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 claimant system itself weeds out extreme cases of of illness and disease. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, certainly. So you know, to be a refugee claimant, you have to find your way here. So certainly, people who are very ill don't have that opportunity. I mean, it's it is a, a bit of a selection test on itself. The journey, uh, as grotesque as that is, I, I think with resettled refugees, it's important to recognize that as of two thousand and three, I believe it was, might have been two thousand four, uh, the Canada eliminated the health exclusion for refugees. So what that means is that if you're applying to come to Canada in any immigration category, uh, you can fulfill every criteria, but you can be denied if you're going to be expensive. Uh, if, if you can put um, uh, a burden on the health and social service system. Well, that health exclusion for the last 13, 14 years no longer applies to resettled refugees. Uh, and certainly for those of us working with this population, we noticed that. So after 2000, after that change was made, uh, I mean, we've had people arrive here who have been quadriplegic. Uh, we've had people who have uh, required dialysis uh, as soon as they've, they've left the airport. So we have seen sicker people. Uh, certainly, and I think for most of us, that's something we take pride in, is that Canada is accepting people not just on their ability to integrate, but because they really need, to, because they're fleeing persecution and they need a safe haven. So, so again, you know, it's uh, we're grouping together a lot of different um, people who have uh, uh, been forced to migrate. Um, you know, I think there's a natural uh, a barrier to people arriving here when they're sick if they've got to make that journey. But I think in some ways, uh, for resettled refugees, we have seen some people arrive who are quite ill. Yeah. Just wanted to, to follow that up uh, with the Syrians that came in the three-month period. There were 25,000 and 14,000, I believe, were government-assisted refugees. And because of the events of November 2015, that is the, um, the Paris bombings and later the one, that, and actually at the same time in Beirut, but uh, also in, in uh, Belgium, Canada was, I think, extremely aware of the need to take people who were legitimate, but also people who were in families. We know that uh, single men, for example, were discriminated against. So of those government-assisted refugees, UNHCR Canada has said that almost every single family was designated in some way as vulnerable, which meant they had a disabled family member, um, uh, some kind of endemic illness. A lot of the, the health challenges were part of the profiles of the government-assisted families, not so much the privately sponsored ones. So this is a really interesting, this is sort of where the, the, the um, humanitarian security nexus, maybe a little bit less enforcement, comes into play. Like you mitigate Canadian public, uh, the Canadian public's fears about people who might be coming from a country where Anyway, people confuse, you know, the refugee f fleeing from ISIS is, and anyway, the, and the, the terrorists themselves, but at least south of the border this is happening. We won't get into that. Uh, but I do think it's interesting that Canada, I think, tried to manage public perception by proactively taking maybe more challenging health cases in this particular, you know, sort of round in the last 18 months with the Syrians. Um, let's open up... Uh discussion from the floor. Um, could we have some lights up so we could see uh, hands? If you have a question, please come to the side. There are microphones um, to speak into. Yeah. Can I start? Yeah. Hi, Andrea Cortinua. I'm an assistant professor at the Dallana School of Public Health. and. Uh, more than a question, I have a couple of uh, comments. <coughs> to me, this, uh, uh, this movie have a particularly strong effect on me because I'm half Canadian, half Italian, and I know very well Lampedusa and Sicily and what's happening in Italy. Uh, so I have two comments, one on the, the Italian side and one on the Canadian one. On the Italian side, I would say that uh, I disagree with uh, the criticism about uh, the uh, limited uh, interpretation of uh, a humanitarian perspective uh, given uh, by the director, knowing a little bit his work too. I think this movie is uh, presented very, very strongly from an Italian perspective. And from an Italian perspective, uh, the um, fire at sea is, is a symbol that brings people back to a generic fear of the unknown that was uh, uh, represented by um, 
military, uh, by the military conflict in the Mediterranean Sea during the Second World War, and that now it is represented by this uh, wave of uh, new arrivals uh, into a culture that for more than 100 years uh, had been systematically emptied by out-migration, and into a, a culture that is uh, very um, uh, marginal to Italian culture in general. To give you an idea, I was very happy that uh, there were English subtitles because I couldn't understand anything uh, in, uh, about what they were saying with the exception of the physician. Um, but uh, Samuele and the other people uh, in the movie speak a language that is very different from mine, which says a lot about also the, this idea of a, a national identity that is often just a myth, right? Um, so I, I think what in a, in a country where every day um, thousands of people essentially are uh, crossing the borders uh, in an unauthorized way, um, that's the effect that uh, um, this, this phenomenon has on, on people, is, a, is, is an anonymous mass of people. And I don't think that uh, the, uh, the director wanted uh, in any way to uh, strengthen this idea. I think it was more a way of showing how a culture that is lost in the past uh, is also lost in the future because nobody knows what's gonna happen. And I think it's very important what some of you said. This is not just about uh, the journey that these people had uh, over the previous three, four, five, six years and what they suffer, but it's very much about uh, their future and the future of Italy and the future of Europe in countries where there is uh, an unemployment uh, among young people that reaches 40% in some areas, so nobody really knows how to deal with this. And the comment on uh, on the Canadian side, I obviously agree about the, the geographic isolation. I suspect we are at a time of uh, change. Things are shifting in that sense too, and it was mentioned by Alison. Um, routes of migration routes are changing, and because of the new administration south of the border, next door we have uh, 11, 12 million, probably more undocumented uh, people. <coughs> who will look for opportunities, for solutions. So I, I think uh, the moving from the more uh, traditional, very um, bureaucratized process of accepting small number of refugees or immigrants uh, to, to one that is messy, that is more uh, closer to the reality of migration is something that we are uh, already witnessing and, and I think uh, the usual uh, vultures of uh, fear have already started screeching, you know, keep them out, it's dangerous, we have to keep this place safe. And not even 100 people had crossed the, the border uh, before they started this, uh, this uh, macabre dance really. And just to give you an idea, in Milan where I have friends who do work in detention center, every day between uh, 600 and 1,000 undocumented uh, arrive by train to the main station every single day of the year. Thank you. Does anybody want to respond? Otherwise, we can take a, a, some more questions from the audience. No, I, I can just say, to, to me, uh, you know, what's going on in the U.S. is the big elephant in the room, right? Uh, I think you know, we will be at a different place a year from now, and uh, I think most of us are expecting numbers to increase exponentially. I mean, be refugee claimants, people undocumented, and it, I completely agree. It'll be it'll be messy to see how the Canadian government responds to it. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it, it's an, it'll be an interesting challenge for Canada at a time that we've always been spared these difficult decisions because the numbers are so low. I also share your point about uh, what I think has been an excessive media response to those few hundred people that have crossed the border. I think we've always seen that. Uh, it's interesting that, um, and you know, again, I preface this by saying it might be very different in a couple of months, but the numbers we're seeing right now is, has been a trickle, and I don't know if it's really out of the ordinary. Um, 
I, I think a lot of those people in the U.S. who are looking, a lot of those 12 million are deeply entrenched in the U.S. Some have been there you know, their whole lives or at least a generation. Um, not, not all of them will find it very easy to move. So a, lo a lot to be, uh, I think the story still has to unravel. And it, it's a very, uh, very tenuous time. I just want to say thank you for your comments and to add that, I mean, one of the things that's, I think, in the film but not necessarily stated explicitly have been all of the tensions between Ital Italians and Maltese and the Greeks, like those who are along the southern border who feel that they carry the, the burden to use some of the language of, of receiving um, and, and contending with um, mass migration and displacement on behalf of the European Union. And so I think there have been times where Lampedusans and also Italians have felt abandoned by the larger EU. And that's a really, I think, prominent discourse in, in this issue as well. Hi, thank you very much again for, for being on the panel today. Um, I wanted to bring it to the Canadian context again and ask a question that uh, speaks to the difference between the government-assisted refugees, the private-sponsored refugees, and refugees who are not Syrian, and what the difference has been in terms of support um, and what that looks like in the future moving forward. Just a quick clarification. When you say support, do you mean financial support, health services? There's, well, there's different support. So the, with the private sponsor, there's been... I've heard that there's just been um, more networking and availability of people to help people out when they're here. So government support, financial support, social support, I mean, any kind of support. Well, I'll take a stab at that very briefly. Um, it's, it's always tricky when people say, you know, sh should we have more people come through the private sponsorship system or the BVOR, not to be confused with the Beaver. BVOR is blended visa office referrals, which means that you have half your support from the government, half from a private sponsorship group, um, or the GARS, the Government Assisted Refugees. Um, so I think probably many people in the audience will know this, but the, the Government Assisted Refugees get a, a federal income assistance stipend for one year. Um, Statistics Canada has a wacky way of calling it, you know, of, of asserting and, and recording this all as social assistance in year one, but it actually is federal assistance. Um, and that gives people license and kind of space to go and access English or French class and and various other services, which I think are really quite vital. On the private sponsorship side, um, the the social capital, that is to say, the networks, the knowledge, the the kind of um, workplaces and institutions that sponsors are plugged into, are a huge resource for the families that are sponsored by private sponsors. And and so that's I, I think quite a lot has been made of that. I know I see one of my colleagues in the in the audience. Um, in the fall of 2015, there was a great, you know, great hurrah by the media about you know, should, who's better, PSRs, privately sponsored refugees, or GARs, and you know who does better, and and it's sort of it's a mixed outcome, and there you know both groups do better on different uh, uh, different you know sort of uh, indicators, but um, I I think listening to CBC yesterday and hearing that there's a new you know double the number of refugees uh, were in Toronto shelters, for example, using Toronto shelters this last month than they were February 2016, is sobering. That month 13, as it's sometimes referred to, is, is, the, is the month during which private, privately sponsored refugees have to segue onto their own uh, resources and or onto Ontario works in the case of Toronto. Uh, that is to say social assistance if they, if they don't have work. Uh, so I think I think there are, um, there's always room to do more. I think that uh, we're, we're sort of experiencing month 13, 14, 15 for, not we are, we are witnessing people going through those, those transitions now and I think they're very challenging. I don't wanna add uh, too much more to that but uh, I hope I've at least answered the question partly. I, I can tell you in terms of healthcare, um, so uh, if we had met a year and a half ago, the the federal insurance program that covers refugees uh, was really a dog's breakfast. I mean, it was based on different types of refugees, where you came from, where you were in the uh, migration process, and now that's been standardized. So privately sponsored refugees, uh, government-assisted refugees, and refugee claimants pretty much have the same health insurance where they get access 
to physicians, diagnostic tests, laboratory tests, like we do with OHIP and, and uh, the CARS and the privately sponsored books also have OHIP. Uh, and uh, they also get ask, uh, access to a basket of supplemental services that will include uh, access to medications, amongst other things. So that's the same across all refugee uh, categories. Just some anecdotal stories. I mean, a colleague of mine in Ottawa ran into somebody who was privately sponsored who had not had not been taken for the OHIP card. They had not had their documents together. They had not been connected to primary care. And so I think it really varies. And we've seen some really wonderful things in terms of private sponsors uh, and what they've done for people. Um, but it's not universal. There are sponsorship groups that run out of steam and, and struggle with it. The other thing, you know, we've run into people where uh, they've had cars bought for them, right, by private sponsors. Uh, we've had people who've been put into just wonderful places here in the annex that, you know, many of us would have trouble affording. The problem that happens is a year later when they're responsible for their own finances, they are moving out and ending up in the, in the places where, um, you know, which are much more affordable but, but are not nearly as, as easy to live in. Um, so, you know, I, I think it really varies. Uh, there is this conventional thinking that private sponsorship uh, people in private sponsorship do better. I don't know if that's always the case. Um, the the study that uh, that I quoted before, uh, the work done by Dr. Beiser, again, going back to the 80s, looked at that, government-assisted and privately sponsored refugees in terms of mental health, health outcomes. And they found that, you know, pri people who are privately sponsored, they entered the workforce earlier, they learned English uh, earlier, but if you follow them out long enough, in terms of mental health, they ended up at the same point. And... Um, you know, to me, it, it seemed a bit confusing, but I remember there was an arrival of Burmese refugees a few years ago, and um, visiting the government-assisted refugees in their apartment buildings was such an event. You know, uh, they all, uh, many of them moved in the same apartment buildings, kids running back and forth, uh, you know, a real sense of community in these buildings. And we had one privately sponsored family that was out in Etobicoke. They were quite isolated. They weren't really connected with the community. They had a tremendous amount of support from their sponsors, but it was a very different experience. And sometimes being in that like community can be a, um, can be protective in terms of mental health outcomes as well. So again, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a clumsy answer, but all that to say, that I think the research actually suggests that, you know, it, there is there is not necessarily an advantage of one versus the other. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm Ethna and I'm a student at the Dalana School of Public Health. I was wondering if you could speak more to the comment that was made about Canada managing per public perception and how, um, at what levels, whether it was civil society or government and how that's changing, especially under the leadership for the conservative race, we're seeing talk of Canadian values coming back and um, what the challenges will be for further maintaining that public perception. Thank you. That is a big question. I think I might start with the first half of it and leave the conservative leadership race for later, or maybe not at all. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, I think uh, uh, I was living in the US when uh, the, the attacks, the Paris attacks and the t attacks in Brussels occurred, and things went so differently in the US um, than they did here. You know, there were, there really was no, um, well, there was no election talk about how many Syrians should we take, will we take, and so on. And, and, uh, and all the parties, it was very tripartisan in that way. Everyone was agreeing that it was a good thing to help the Syrians. For some reason, they were the flavor of the day, even though they'd been around for five years and no one had paid any attention to them under the previous government. Um, but, but I think, yeah, how do you, it, it, it's civil society. I think three ducks have to line up for, for re refugee resettlement to happen. Asylum continues to be more challenging in Canada as both of the experts on either side of me have, have uh, illuminated. One thing that Canada did to, I think, um, also minimize any sense of risk, risk was, was a theme in the film which was dealt with deftly and well, I thought. But for example, uh, there was talk of pro processing like security and health um, screening in, um, mili on military bases in Canada. After uh, the November attacks in Paris, that idea was squashed and all processing uh, security and health was done in Jordan, in Turkey and offshore. So people were not gonna touch down on Canadian soil until they had met all the, the requirements. So that was another I think a way, I don't know if it was explicitly stated as such, but, but I was, it was impressive to watch the fact that the civil society in Canada, it could have gone terribly wrong after, after the Paris attacks. And somehow the messaging, the three ducks, government leadership, 
uh, media messaging and civil society public opinion. Those three things have to line up to be able to bring refugees in, as far as I'm concerned. And they, they continued and were able, that messaging was, was still possible somehow um, and deliberate on the part of the government, I think, after uh, the Paris attacks. So I don't know, in terms of this Canadian values uh, discussion, I'm not, I don't necessarily want to wade into that one right now, um, except to say um, that I still think the three ducks thesis will hold. The, the, the popular opinion and uh, civil society um, engagement to support refugees depends on uh, government leadership, and we didn't have that under the previous regime, um, and also the media messaging. The media will, will repeat what government ministers say, such as bogus refugee. Uh, so if the minister says that and the media repeats it, all of a sudden people's opinion of refugees starts to erode, and I think that's what happened under the previous conservative government. Um, but we're in a different space now. I don't think it's all perfect. Uh, let's see what happens. I think one of the ways to deal with that is to get Kelly Leach to make more videos. Because <laughs> that will be the end of her, at least. Um, you know, I, I think for us, and, and I know it's misguided to think that research shapes public policy, um, but I think it certainly allows us leverage. Um, I'm always astounded at how little literature there is that tells us how well refugees do. I mean, this is certainly our experiences uh, when we watch people go through their migration. You know, I keep quoting this study that was done in the 1980s by, by Morley Beiser, and I think it's very instructive, but we haven't seen that type of work to really, um, you know, demonstrate what I think a lot of us are seeing, right? I mean, we see it in our medical school classes, we see it in, in the universities, that we know refugees are doing very well, um, and that's not just the Vietnamese. I mean, that's... Uh, the Ugandans and I mean almost all groups that come through, but I think we need to document that. Uh, you know, there's people in this room who are involved in large studies looking at uh, the trajectory of the of the Syrian migration, and I think you know information like that helps because we can draw on it and say that you know what the stereotypes that the previous government portrayed of uh, of refugee claimants and and privately sponsored and all refugees are grossly inaccurate. Um, and right now, I, I think we know that, but uh, but that information is not so easy to call us. It's just not there in a, in a significant way. And I think the onus on those of us in healthcare and those of you that are researchers, it's really important to document that. We have time maybe for one more question or comment from the, the audience. Yeah, Michaela. making that I think really highlight a tension in how we talk about refugees depending on what the purpose of the communication is. And on the one hand, one of the ways that we try to motivate people to be the civil society, to be more open and welcoming to refugees, to increase the number of uh, opportunities for asylum, is by portraying refugees as people who are incredibly vulnerable, taking terrible risks, who are suffering. And that then doesn't translate into the second message, which is what happens after they've arrived in the country. So there's a tension between portraying the vulnerability of refugees as a way of motivating civil society to be more open and more accepting, and then othering them, which makes the process of settlement, once they've arrived, more difficult. And I wonder if you can talk about your perception of how we balance those two motives and the different messages that tend to align with them. I'm going to invite the panel to uh, maybe uh, respond to the question, also uh, give any other closing thoughts uh, in general on the discussion. I'll just have a quick um, uh, try to, that's a big question and it's a huge one. I think we have to be so careful to avoid the, the kind of rescue narrative um, because, you know, uh, it's we are rescuing them and that is not a very tenable way to um, really think about how when people come to our country and are successful asylum claimants and or resettled refugees, how can we make them us? And I think it's it's a big question. I don't know how, um, I mean, I think citizenship, there's a formal version of it, and then there's a, the informal version, which I think you're getting at, which is a tension between how do we get beyond being hosts of refugees and making the club of us big enough for everyone who's here in Toronto. And I, I don't exactly know how we can do that, but we have to be ever so vigilant not to not to reproduce that othering 
uh, because we know that resettlement, we, we know that any kind of transition into Canadian society is a tough one, whether it's housing or, or, or you know, even getting OHIP, uh, but that we have to s work very hard. And I think Toronto is the place where maybe that happens in some of the most exciting ways possible, but also some of the most challenging. Um, don't know the answer beyond that. And I think I'll just leave it there. Um, th I might answer slightly differently than, than what you're asking, but um, I want to go back to Lampedusa and to the film and, and the issue of representation. I mean, there are all these um, really interesting uh, kind of transnational movements happening right now around these migrations. And um, one, one thing that's happening is there's this almost like a cottage industry of scholars and activists who are trying to document losses at sea and so trying to, that's, I mean, that's one effort at humanization, right? To expose the, uh, the violence that people are experiencing um, and to, to expose the, the crisis. Um, but at the same time, as you note, um, showing that vulnerability can fuel um, the crisis narrative and other and um, add to the idea of statistics and numbers and the abstract nature of people who are crossing by boat. So some of the most kind of hopeful and exciting political um, movements that I've seen uh, related specifically to boat migration have been um, people um, pushing back against those and telling their own stories. Um, and, and part of that is um, migrating and seeking asylum and entering cities and entering centers of power and joining in solidarity with others to really humanize the situation and, and tell the story. Um, one example comes from Lampedusa, where a group of activists were sneaking into the boat cemetery and um, gathering ephemera, bits of things that were left on the, the boats that were there um, to make a small museum of immigration and to tell the histories of those who had passed through the island. And another story is related to Lampedusa of people who are I living in Germany who, who, sh who come from many different countries but who share in common that they spent time on Lampedusa. And so there are groups called Lampedusa in Berlin and Lampedusa in Hamburg. And they're joining forces um, because they still don't have legal status and recognition um, in Germany or in the EU to call attention to, um, to their plight and to humanize and tell their own stories and stage plays about it and protests about it. And so I think um, it's not exactly you know, juxtaposing, again, the um, resettled refugee and the kind of dehumanized other at sea, but to see that, um, that each of these stories is full and complex and that those movements and solidarities um, open up spaces uh, to tell the stories um, that, that show that there's a, a we <laughs> as, as much as there is a, um, a, divide, a divide, which is what we see in the securitized discourses and all of that enforcement at sea. Well, I mean, it's an excellent question. I think we all struggle with that. Um, I don't really have an answer, but the one thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, I think both those portrayals have some accuracy. I mean, a lot of the people we see have lived through horrific things and are, were very vulnerable. Um, but yet that's what makes them resilient and that's what makes them capable. And, uh, you know, it, it might actually be interrelated. Um, as far as last words, I, I just think we're at a very critical time when it comes to migration. I mean, the numbers globally are as high as they've ever been, but I, I think we're all, as we're seeing uh, doors close, I think it's a reminder for all of us that, um, you know, this is a very tenuous time for, for people all across the world and it's really our, you know, for those of us that see the, the wonders of, uh, of increasing global migration and the contribution to different societies, it, it's really gonna be a challenge for us in the very short term uh, to make sure that those, um, those perspectives are heard, so. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, a wonderful panel, uh, and some of the, the comments from the audience which gave really uh, different ways to think about the efficacy of this movie in particular. I think we're particularly aware in the context of uh, migration in the Syrian conflict of the power of, of an image, the picture of Elaine Kurdi on the beach, galvanized people into response in a way that uh, information about the crisis hadn't. And I, I was struck by what, I'm not sure if the, the uh, directors intended Samuel's lazy eye to be a metaphor. I thought it was a fitting metaphor for us to take away from this movie of what we need to do to force ourselves to see. <laughs>
thank you, everybody. Please join us for popcorn and for a community, uh, 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 for discussion with community groups afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>